welcome to the 81st annual Cold Spring Harbour Laboratory Symposium on Quantitative Biology. This year's topic is on targeting cancer and I'm Gemma Alderson from Nature Reviews Cancer and I'm here today with Dave Tuverson from Cold Spring Harbour. So Dave, I haven't seen you speak yet today, so, uh, or later, this, later in the meeting, so I wonder if you could uh, give us a kind of short overview without you know, ruining, ruining the highlights or kind of giving all the game away about uh, kind of what you're going to tell us about. Uh, sure, Gemma. My laboratory studies pancreatic cancer. We are trying to go beyond the what of pancreatic cancer to the why, why it makes you sick and why the medicines we have don't work. Um, for the purpose of just demonstrating how we're going to use that information to help patients. Right. Right. So what are the kind of the, the directions that you're taking that at the moment in terms of improvement? When I started in the cancer field 20 years ago, we didn't understand what caused cancer. Mm -hmm. And I'd say if you went back 20 years in most uh, cancer labs, it was the same question. What, what is cancer? What, what, it, what causes it, et cetera? And so many people investigated the genes of cancer, finding mutations that were associated with that cancer built mouse models of the cancer to demonstrate that the gene was sufficient to cause the cancer. More recently, the mouse models have been used to show that it was necessary for the cancer. But at this stage, we now know the what. Right. And so what my laboratory has been concentrating on for the past five years or so is knowing what causes pancreas cancer, why? Why is this still a bad disease? Why don't our medicines work better? Why is it that mice and people are sick when they have pancreas cancer? And for the why, we've turned to a different model system um, by collaborating with Hans Cleavers, which is a tissue-based system. Uh, he calls them organoids. Right. And this has been extremely illuminating for us uh, because it's allowed us to ask that why question both with mice and with patient human tissue mm -hmm. and uh, the results have been uh, startling and uh, so I'll talk about that when I give my uh, seminar uh, in a few days uh, because we're trying to use that new information to develop approaches for right. patients. Right. So is the so obviously the development of the organoids um, improves upon cell culture experiments and that sort of traditional Kind of approach particularly for cancer because it takes into account the tumor microenvironment would that would that be um, accurate do you think or the HeLa cells of the 50s uh, were was a start mm -hmm. you know for the cancer field um, today you can grow those type of cultures for many but not all cancers yeah. Yeah. The, the value of these tissue-based models be they organoids or conditionally reprogrammed cells or related approaches is that you can grow both normal cells and neoplastic cells right. and there aren't methods that allow you to grow normal cells besides ones where you have to put in genes to immortalize the cells and so you can compare normal to tumor within the same patient or the same experimental animal model that's a huge advantage yeah. to the past you mentioned could you add in the microenvironment and our early efforts in this suggest you can, mm -hmm. at least some of the types of cells. We've focused on the cancer fibroblast, right. and we can add that into the epithelial pancreas uh, organoid cultures, and we've learned things that we never would have known to look for if we were starting from tissue samples from patients or from mice. Right. And so again, the it illuminates things that you wouldn't necessarily see mm -hmm. and allows you to measure things that you really can't. And so I do think that they are transformative right. for the field and, and we've been benefiting you know, from that for the past several years and we have some exciting new findings uh, due to the you know, hard work and excellence of the postdocs and students in, in my lab. Mm -hmm. So do, you, do the organoids um, replicate the physiology that you would see within a tissue, so the pancreas, in terms of, do you see the ducts and like that? They approximate it, and, and right. so for the pancreas, what you are able to do is, is grow ducts, mm -hmm. but not as tubular structures. They grow actually as spheres. Right. And 
In the pancreas, we are growing that lineage, not the others. Hans's group and others have shown that at least in the intestines, you can grow multiple lineages and get mini guts and stomach. You can make glands that produce acid and right. you know exotic things of that wow. nature. Yeah. With the pancreas, we, we have not been able to make a intact pancreas, for example. Uh, that's not the focus of my laboratory, though. Um, developmental biologists are pushing those types of questions because in the in the pancreatic health field, diabetes is the main human health problem. Mm. And if you could grow the endocrine cells of the pancreas, that potentially you know would be very beneficial. Yeah, we, we focus on cancer, and the duct is we we feel uh, very much related to the cell that causes cancer in the pancreas, um, at least the majority of types of cancer. And so, I, I think it would be an exaggeration to say that we're probing physiology deeply. We can probe pathophysiology deeply. Right. And, um, but that for our purposes, it's sufficient. Okay. And can these, so these organoids, as I understand it, can also be used um, translationally, right? To improve the way we think about sort of translational uh, science for yeah. pancreatic cancer. In particular. Yeah, that's the big excitement yeah. in our laboratory. Um, we can measure things that we couldn't measure before. And so therefore you, you discover things, mm. new genes, new pathways, um, et cetera. Um, one of the, findings that we've had is that we can study uh, metabolism using right. the organoids differently right. than you can in two-dimensional culture and and the differences are um, you know very uh, evident between right. two-dimensional and three-dimensional culturing so what's the mechanism um, for that what, what causes that difference it's an excellent you? question we don't precisely know but but again the three-dimensional organoids the cells are polarized right so there's an apical basal lateral surface okay whereas when you're growing two dimension the cell can't tell up from down side from side and to survive on plastic you have to um, be able to proliferate under high tension mm -hmm. which activate many signaling pathways such as the integrins and others and so these are cells that um, are able to exist under such harsh conditions in the organoid uh, it's less stressful in terms of right. the actual tension on the cell mm -hmm. membrane and I, I do think that the polarization of the um, of the cells allows you to to look at the pathways as they would exist in vivo okay. um, properly uh, that's a prediction a hypothesis yeah. uh, something we're testing right now right. Um, but the, the question you asked just a minute or two ago is could you do more translational things with yeah. the organoids again I'm a uh, I'm a cancer doctor and you know I got into the field because I was trying to think of a better way to help my patients it, it turned out I've spent the last 15 years doing more science than medicine um, but with the organoids we now can identify aspects of pancreas cancer that we couldn't using cell lines or using mice Such and as? these things are relevant we think in how we might treat or diagnose the disease right. Um, so one of the vignettes that I'll give uh, in a few days, we'll talk about how you can use um, the organoids to compare again normal to neoplastic in efforts to identify proteins which are expressed specifically by cancer but not by normal. Right. And these proteins become obviously uh, fingerprints for the cancer but not the normal. The normal in our system is proliferating. And only normal proliferating cells that we have that are epithelial are cells that um, are dividing because there's been, because you're developing as an embryo or because there's been trauma, inflammation, right. where there's regeneration. Mm -hmm. um, and in the pancreas, the trauma would be called pancreatitis. Okay. And pancreatitis is a condition that makes it hard for doctors to figure out if you have a benign or a malignant disease. So with the organoids, we can separate that out and very quickly say, these are proteins, for example, that are in proliferating normal cells, which would happen only in pancreatitis, right. whereas those are in proliferating cancer cells. Yeah. And so by using the comparison, we can very rapidly distinguish the two. And um, uh, this very talented postdoc in my lab, uh, Danny Engel, has been able to use this approach to identify proteins that she thinks are specific for cancer. And when she looks at those proteins, based on our organoid system, into human blood that either are people who do or don't have pancreas cancer, she's been right, I think, 10 out of 11 times. Wow. And these are brand new 
potential biomarkers, as it yeah. were, for yeah. uh, pancreas cancer. And, yeah. and, and, and so even from a skeptical standpoint, um, you have to be a bit encouraged that, mm. that we are able to see deeply into the problem that we couldn't before. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's one thing uh, the organizers will help with diagnostics, detection, right. etc. Yeah. The other is the, you, uh, the obvious thing, which is could you use the organoids to personalize therapies? Could you use it to pick a medicine that might help a patient? And a, a whole team of, of workers in the laboratory ha has been taking that approach. And we're in the early stages, but you know, so far it's pretty exciting. Um, they've identified a few therapies that when we look in the animal models, they look active. Mm -hmm. And so the organoids appear to be putting us on the right track. Okay. Um, and then finally, the last vignette I'll, I'll mention on Saturday is the microenvironment that you mentioned. Being able to study that interaction between the cells that are in the stroma of the tumor right. as they communicate with the epithelial cells, that's, that's a challenging mm -hmm. task. And, but with the organoids, we have an angle on that. And um, the tumor microenvironment team in the, uh, in the laboratory has identified a type of stromal cell. Uh, because of this uh, activity and the cell looks you know exciting because it's uh, you know like a version of a, of a fibroblast that's never been reported and has kind of the right characteristics of something that you know um, might promote cancer in a significant right. way. Right. Yeah. I mean the tumor environment for um, microenvironment for pancreatic cancer is a, a really interesting field right and there seems to be quite a a few controversies in terms of whether the microenvironment is protective versus promoting. Could you could you comment on that? Well, I mean, so the controversy, in essence, is if you think of a pancreas uh, cancer, yet the the uh, metaphor I like to use with the lay public is imagine an oatmeal cookie nice. with raisins in it, and the raisins are the cancer cells, and the oatmeal is the stroma. Okay. So all that t all that sticky dough. And um, so there, there's more dough than there are raisins. And what we found um, some time ago was that that stroma made it difficult for the vasculature to both develop and function. And we hypothesized that due to this, we couldn't deliver drugs into the tumor. And when we use various methods to lessen the stroma, the drugs could get in better. And in mouse models, it appeared that that would be beneficial. You could kill more cancer cells, the mice would live a bit longer. Mm. Um, when the initial idea was taken into the clinic, it, it wasn't promising. And in fact, the patients did worse when the stromal ablation approach was taken with the hedgehog inhibitor. Right. And the dissatisfying part of that was that, there, um, as is true of unfortunately many clinical trials, there was not a really a scientific angle to the, to the to the trial. Yeah. No one, biopsies were not taken. Mm -hmm. There was really no scientist, you know, with their mm -hmm. eye on the trial. And so in the end, when they wanted my advice, I asked them, what do the biopsies show? And they said, what biopsies? And this is the frustration of scientists when yeah. we see our work um, not tested properly, you know, in the clinical setting. And so we actually have, you know, not lost, uh, you know, attention on this fact that it failed in the humans, it looked promising in the mice. And so the organ and co-culture actually allowed us to go back and ask these questions. And we think now the description of this other type of fibroblast may be a partial explanation for why things got a bit rocky for the patients. Right. Um, that's our, you know, that's our hypothesis based on the, the data we have available to us right now. So we don't tend to think that um, the stroma is a friend in this. The stroma clearly can regulate the differentiation of the cancer cells and well differentiated tumors tend to behave differently than undifferentiated tumors. Um, and uh, the hedgehog uh, um, inhibitor trials made it difficult for the well differentiated cancers to persist and so you selected for a type of carcinoma which was less differentiated but we think that was only part of it. The other part was that the type of fibroblast you were left with was one that would promote cancer much worse right. than the first type. So how would you better do that clinical trial in the future? Eyes wide open. Right. You know, so I actually, you know, I feel as a, as a human doctor and a you know, basic scientist uh, that we have an obligation to perform early phase clinical trials, so-called phase zero trials, right. where 
where the first few patients that are treated with a new medicine or evaluated with new diagnostic technique, uh, this is a trial done where the endpoints are molecular and scientific, um, where yes, there are still the uh, safeguards for safety, et cetera, but the doses of drugs used and the time period of the experiment are short. Mm -hmm. Um, these phase zero type trials don't happen in general um, for several reasons. Uh, the main one being that the Ivory Tower academic centers don't have such facilities. Right. Um, the second one being that the pharmaceutical companies who are our friend in developing new medicines don't have the patience for conducting these studies nor the um, bankroll for supporting them. Yeah. And then what we're getting better at though are the funding agencies who are now recognizing that these are important. Mm. And so I, I'm really hopeful that um, scientists can become part of the early phase clinical trials process, working with proper doctors, not so they would you know, put on a white coat and <laughs> try to um, do something inappropriate, but yeah. rather so they could help interpret the early data. Um, and, you know, what we feel at Cold Spring Harbor is that if we could design these you know, early phase, phase zero type studies um, in a medical setting where you could have uh, if need be 24 seven monitoring, mm -hmm. you could learn in a few hours or a few days if you were on the right track or not right. for most therapies and most diagnostics, even immunotherapies. Uh, and uh, that's, our, that's, that's our hope. And that, the organoids, we, we are expecting to be the ex vivo part of this experiment, mm -hmm. but we need to do in vivo phase zero studies also. Yeah, yeah. Some impressive future challenges for the sure. Well, I mean, when you study a disease where uh, the mortality of the disease is about equal to the incidence of the disease, right. um, you know, you're, you're in the red zone, yeah. you know, and, and you, can, you can try to cook field goals all day long, but you'll never win anything. And we have to, uh, we have to change our approach. Yeah. We have to be aggressive, not complacent. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. <laughs>